بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد صلاة نكون بها محبوبين لك ومحبوبين له وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد صلاة نكون بها محبوبين لك ومحبوبين له وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد صلاة نكون بها محبوبين لك ومحبوبين له وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد نفتاح باب رحمة الله عدل ما في علم الله صلاة وسلام دائما بدوام ملك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد نورك الساري ومدرك الجاري وجمعنا به في كل أطوار وعلى آله وصحبه نور اللهم نور لنا البصائر وصف لنا السرائر ووسع لنا المشاهد وصف لنا الموارد فلقد نوينا جميعا أن تعلم التعليم وتذكر التذكير ونفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والدعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وتوابه سبحانه وتعالى الحمد لله بسم الله بدأنا so we begin in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and uh, through this uh, the beginning we hope to know more about Allah سبحانه وتعالى uh, it said it's not a hadith, but it's a, one of the early sayings of one of the early the righteous people. Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu. The one that truly knows themselves, that they they know their Lord, they know Allah. And there are different, um, there are various unpackings of this hadith, of this saying, what it means, what it entails. Uh, but the one that knows themselves knows their Lord. And there's an implication here that if we don't really know Allah, and what does it mean to know Allah, to have that deep experiential uh, closeness, awareness, consciousness of Him. All of these words are kind of, uh, you could say, topical. Uh, they're contemporary. Consciousness seems to be the in thing, being present, being mindful. All of these kind of words are the kind of, uh, um, they're selling books. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, one of the peop people that's kind of at the forefront of that kind of uh, expression of things. Uh, I heard he sold six million and then just in a recent interview it actually sold 12 million. And it's been translated into over 50 different languages. Which is very interesting because what it does display is that there's a thirst for something. That people are thirsty for something. And often we don't really know what we're thirsty for. So it's typically when somebody like, you know, I feel hungry, it's often it's, you're actually thirsty. Um, maybe not everyone, depends. Maybe some people are hungry. But it, it's the, we, we become um, far removed from these components within us that, that are designed to tell us something about ourselves. At its most... Um, apparent or superficial stage, it's the five senses. That's how we know things. That's, how, that's our experience of the world. How do you know what's real? Well, I can see it. I can taste it. I can touch it. I can smell it. I can hear it. So our definition of reality often is locked or constrained within that which we can perceive or not perceive. Now, the implications to that are also kind of worrying. That if we don't perceive it, it doesn't exist. Now, in our tradition, uh, that's not the case. That's not our understanding. Um, the title of today's um, session is uh, The Journey Begins, which I thought was interesting because there's this concept of like, okay, so when do we move? A journey implies movement. But this is also a movement that can't be seen. And over the period of what would be roughly around 20 different sessions, we're going to explore something about a movement within, a movement deeper into you, into who you are. And that's going to take 
um, some tools and they're going to take some instruments, they're going to take some, um, uh, some maps, some coordinates, some guidelines. Because often when you're talking about things figuratively, it's very diffi difficult to really understand what it is you're talking about. And this is why very frequently within this discipline, the great masters of this tradition would articulate um, most of what they meant in poetry. Because simple prose wasn't able to, to cradle or even approximate anything of the profundity and the beauty of that which they were implying. So they'll talk about, you'll often hear examples of the rose. What's the rose mean? You'll, you'll often hear examples, even in certain uh, traditions, of uh, an intoxicating, like a wine. We're not talking about alcohol here. Uh, we're talking about a different type of, um, of consciousness that's so intensive, so intense it has this effect upon the human soul. Now, the primary focus of today's session is what you would call in Arabic ta'seel the asl of something, the foundation of something. And this is really important whenever we engage in any, um, uh, in any kind of science, in any discipline, any kind of art. We, we know what's the root of that which we're engaging with. And because there are many claimants, and there are many claims, and there are many false claims. And if the science in its essence is about approaching that which is authentic, that which is real, al-haq, jalla jalala, and being real with al-haq, then we've got to keep it real from the word go. And that's also a claim. I'm going to keep it real. What does that mean? It's so subjective. It means you're keeping it real in your context, at your vibe, how you feel on that day. What does it really mean to keep it real within our tradition? Simply put is that we go back to that first communication, uh, the Qur'an, you know, we have Allah is he's a communicating creator. Yeah, he's mutakallim, uh, that's one of his divine attributes, and that's continuously taking place. And once we have that expression within wahi, within divine revelation, which they say is munqata and nuzul it's kind of, um, it's rev the process of revelation has now stopped, the tanazul, or the, the deep, profound meanings within the Qur'an remain open. So this is why we hear different people of insight and spiritual experience and depth, that they're able to have this connection with the Qur'an, that they're continuously drawing new meanings, new ma'ani. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, if you want to understand the tafsir of the Qur'an, just wait for time to pass. Because in the annals of time, you have context. Space and time together, you have context. And you can get dimensions from which you can get meaning. You know, it's not haphazard that the 23 years, which the Prophet wasallam took in conveying the message, was 23 years. It wasn't as if we kind of cut a few corners and became slightly more productive, that we could have whittled it down to five. There's a, there's, a, there's a divine wisdom in that 23 years because certain things require time. It, there's no real meaning to patience if you don't have the vessel of time, if everything just happened. You know, we've constructed this in our own kind of worlds, you know, within the construct of modernity. So we have concepts of fast food. Ancient peoples, traditional peoples would find that disturbing. Like, but food isn't fast. You can't make food fast. Therefore, it's not food. And therefore, the, the, the essence of the, 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 the barakah, the blessing within the preparation, is somehow taken away from it. So you get moved out of this world of meaning and, and locked into this world of superficiality. So in understanding this, we go back to the, 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 the source. Now, one of the things we have in our time, I'm going to keep it very kind of plain because I, I want people to, you know, if they, they want to discuss things, they want to further clarification on certain things, it's important people feel that openness. But in our time now, typically people will say, like, 
it's from the Quran and Sunnah, it, and it's done in a reactionary sense. Like it's done on the defensive. No, we can prove this. It's in the Quran and Sunnah. Um, and that's because of d various different ideologies which have come about over the last 100 years or so. Um, and it's put people on like a knee-jerk reaction. Now it's important to know that everything that we do goes back to the Book of Allah and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad It's essential. But we don't do it to be on the defensive. We do it because that which is, that's our source, that's our tradition, that's our religion. So yeah. MashaAllah, how far are we in? We've kind of warmed up slightly. 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes. Okay, I'm hoping the longer I spend in Sweden, that time is going to be shorter and shorter. I'm going to be in a t shirt by the end of the two months. <laughs> SubhanAllah. You're going to have to forgive me. I'm kind of somewhat adjusting from a, a desert climate. And uh, although it was winter there, it's not exactly the winter in Sweden. I'm actually wearing the same things as I was wearing in Yemen, so apologies. I'm also kind of slightly, I don't know how to say this without sounding wrong, but I've got quite a bit of, uh, what is it, paracetamol and ibuprofen in my blood. And we didn't catch the coffee shop in time. So that coupled with some out, without some caffeine, hopefully you can bear with me, inshallah. No. So, what are we talking about here today? What we're talking about is the science of Ihsan. The science of Ihsan. Ihsan, as we know, is an Arabic word which ultimately is rooted in the meaning of beauty, Husan. We have the name Hassan, Hussein, the small or the young Hassan, and it's all related to beauty or rendering something beautiful. So the Arabs will say, although typically now, in colloquial Arabic, if you say this to a grown man, he'll take offense to it. So you say, Ahsent. It's kind of like patting him on the head. But often you would say that in traditional cultures, Ahsenta, Ahsenta. You, li you did well, or literally you made it beautiful. You know, it's like saying well done or thank you. Like people say in Arabic, they don't have a translation for thank you. What does thank you even really mean? And ahsanta means something, you rendered something beautiful. And that's really the, the, the purpose of the believer, to become acquainted with beauty, to have that beauty inculcated within yourself, and to be a conduit of projecting that beauty um, throughout. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so it's the science of beautification. Now, what does that mean? Well, we've got a, the whole, this whole series is going to be to do with orientation. And part of that orientation, as we said, is going to be about movement. But we're not moving physically. We're all sat here now. But there's an inward movement taking place. And what that means is there are going to be certain thoughts or certain train, they say like a train of thought in English. Like that train is going to have to change its station and it's going to have to um, reroute in order to be able to understand and have certain things unlocked that are already within you. So, one of the examples that the scholars will use in understanding the science is it's like a seed. The, the human being is like a seed. Now, most seeds are pretty unremarkable things. They're kind of quite plain. They're simple. If you look at it, normally small. It's, it's unremarkable. There's nothing to remark about it. But the potential that is already in it, that's, un, that's locked within it, can be incredible. It could be a tree, which could be, provide fruit or nourishment or flowering if it blossoms and blooms. But it has to first be thrown, placed underground. And this is why one of the great, um, you could say, inheritors from the Prophet وسلم, and masters of this tradition, somebody called Imam uh, Umar ibn Abdurrahman al Atas. He would say to his children, a defen, a defen. Literally, bury yourselves. What does that mean? Go out into the ground, like dig a grave and just go under the soil? It doesn't mean that. What it means is, may your, like, make sure that your internal state is one that is, is, is humble, is rooted, 
In English, we say grounded. Do you have something similar in Swedish? I'm going to ask you certain questions because language is an amazing tool to really, and a lot of, we, ha we have a lot of these things in our languages, both English and Swedish, although the spirituality has often been ripped from them from, since maybe around the Enlightenment period. But it's still within that. So if somebody's grounded, like you say, at least in, uh, I don't know, all over England, but we say that, like, soul to the earth. Uh, you know, a down, some of these down to earth. You, say, you have this? How do you say it? You matter. Okay. To close, to earth. close to earth. So what does that mean? They're kind of real. They're plain. There's no, like, pretentiousness about them. Or like, okay, similar thing. Somebody's down to earth. What you see is what you get. You get what you, what you see on the, you know, it says on the tin. And that's really what this science is about. It's understanding what Islam for it truly is. Understanding who you for who you are. Seeing Allah for who he is. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in, in his dua, Allahumma arini al-haqqa haqqan wa razuqna al-ittiba'a. Oh Allah, show me haqq as it is, as haq truly is, and allow me to follow it. And show me batil as batil, I'm not translating it purposely because we need to go into this. Batil, as batil truly is, and allow me to refrain from it, allow me to abstain from it. Now, O oh Allah, show me haq. You could say truth. But in a post postmodern like Northern European, what does truth even mean? Truth, well, your truth is not my truth. Your, you being real is not me being real. Your reality is not my re reality. And this is why we have to have coordinates. So we understand what it is what we're talking about, orientating towards. And this is what the prophets والسلام, came to do. And what we'll be talking about in more extensively next session, inshallah, is the nature of this map that they also bequeathed to us, they gave to us in that which was given. Kim doesn't like me using that word. He thinks it's like some medieval English word, bequeathed. He really, last year when I was here, he told me off so many times. I know what it means now. Bequeathed. I'm sure they've used it before, since the time of Henry VIII. But, you know, I don't know. To give, to bestow, to like, you know, give just sounds a bit, give is actually uh, from Sweden. Give and take are Old Norse words. Yeah, give and take. When you're here now. <laughs> yeah. For heck of that. What were we talking about? I told you, I'm going to have a few kind of lapses. I'm going to blame it on the jet lag. If it carries on after a few minutes' time, then you know, you, know, you just need to be making more dua for me. Haq, how could we forget? So, Haq. Huh? Tamam. So related to that is, is haq. How would you translate haq? Truth? Because it's also one of the names of Allah. Al haq. And the Prophet asked for this. Oh Allah, show Arini, you show me. It's not Allah, it's very different. It's not let me see, it's you cause me to see. You know, expose it before me. Haq as it truly is. One of the nicest like, uh, translations that I've heard is authenticity. Because it's, it's, the, it's the absolutely authentic, the unadulteratedly real. It's that which you can't get more real. It's the, like the base component of, of absolute reality. Haqiqat al haqaiq the ultimate reality. Oh Allah, show me reality as it truly is. Because sometimes people can see something but it's distorted, like, and it may be from the person, that the lens that you're viewing it from, we'll be using this analogy frequently, that that's not really real. Somebody can see something and it's true, it's absolutely real, but they're not able to see it, it's distorted. And allow, then on top of that, and allow me to follow it, ittiba, allow me to follow it. And this is why typically in the Qur'an you, all, you always have faith, although even that word we can explore a bit more. because. Iman is, is not quite faith. It's far deeper than that. Whenever you hear the, the concept of Iman, it's always followed with وَعَمِنُ الصَّالِحَاتِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُ الصَّالِحَاتِ Those who believe 
and you can say, do righteous actions, but the, the proof is manifested in that which they do. So the science of Ihsan is monitoring those things. It's to do with introspection, going deeper within, which implies that you need to have um, instruments to understand what it's all about. Because you can think, if someone can lie, you know, daydream and think about their own thoughts, but it may not be effective. And here we have also the concept of that which the Prophet ﷺ gave to us was the methodology. And this is one of the things we'll be speaking about frequently. Okay, if we want to keep it real with Allah, we want to keep it real with ourselves, we need a methodology. We need a method, we need a way. And for many Muslims, Islam has been reduced to literally something that you do or don't do for fear of some kind of imminent kind of catastrophe that if you don't do it and it's far deeper you know it's like I Islam is praying five times a day and trying to keep away from you know not eating haram beef burgers or something sorry like the prophet he said and what he came for is far more profound even the prayer and understanding of the prayer this science what it does is it unlocks the way you enter into the prayer so it's not like why are you praying because it's time to pray that's a really weak intention in accordance to the people of this science. Because it's almost like, because you have to. It's, where's the love? Where's the awe? Where's the yearning? The uns? Where's the passion? Where's the desire? You know, and all of these signs are indicative of the, where our hearts are at. And so this science, you're going to have to learn about the nature of your heart. So we're going to be talking about muraqaba, which is the... You could, say, you could say the discipline of, of introspection, to learn how to understand where your heart's at, to do a bit of self-diagnosis. Sometimes the doctors aren't available and the clinics are shut, and you might have to do a bit of DIY. You know, in order to keep you, you know, to the next, to when you see someone. So we're gonna be talking about some of these tools. This, the science of Ihsan is the most empowering science the most empowering discipline. Because what it does is it gives you this survival pack, both intellectually, meaning in terms of that which your mind can understand, and it's a nourishment for the heart. So you can pinpoint now, why is this depletion taking place? Why am I feeling, feeling low in Iman? What took place there? What it does is it says, okay, now you have a map, and now you have these coordinates. I'll give you, I'll give you one example. One of the things the scholars of this science, they say, if you, if you feel like a, almost like an immediate deflation, so it's like a balloon, like your hal, and we'll talk about what this means. We'll talk about ahwal and maqamat. Your state, sometimes you feel like really, yeah, I'm feeling good. And all of a sudden, it's like a balloon bursting. It's like, what, what went wrong? I don't know. And then what do we do? We, we self-medicate. We go through things that maybe aren't even good for us. In its worst stages, we veer even towards that which is not, not halal. And many Muslims, unfortunately, are in this state because a lot of it's a yearning to like cover this pain or this emptiness or this, the heart requires it. It has to be filled. But it can only be nourished and sustained by that which is haq. And that's why the Prophet asks for it continuously. So they say, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّكَ تَكَلَّمْتْ فِي مَا لَا يَعْنِيكَ Know that you've spoken about that which does not concern you. If you feel like pfft, you've said something that has no meaning to you, like the Prophet ﷺ, min husn Islam al mar'i. So a lot of what we'll be talking about and exploring is some of the adab of prophetic communi communication, how to speak, you know, when to speak, the right way to speak, the intentionality behind speech. That it's not just the vocalization, it's not just the final part where you're, you know, the, the, um, the sounds resonate in your vocal cords and the breath and hit your lips and your teeth and your tongue and it comes out in a certain formation. That's the very last point, to go and trace back, why am I saying what am I saying? Why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? Why am I acting the way I'm acting? مِنْ حُسْنْ إِسْلَامَ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ it's from the beauty, once again, of the Islam of a person to leave that which has no meaning to them. 
and it's often translated, is that which does not concern them. But literally, it's مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ It has no meaning to you. Because sometimes somebody could be engaged with something, and it's meaningful in their context. To them, this is, this is their shan, this is their affair, this is what they should be doing. But it's like getting involved in someone else's business that has no meaning to you now. Has no meaning to you facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَوْمَ يَقُومَ الْعَرْضَ عَلَى اللَّهِ The day in which you're summoned to be, literally to be displayed and examined before Allah. Fulan ibn Fulan, the, such and such, the son of, of such and such, of the, the daughter of such and such. You know. And the science of ihsan is to be in this constant state of iqbal, of reception. It's like a receiver. Your heart's always ready to receive. One of the scholars, and we'll be referencing throughout the course also, uh, for further reading, some of the scholars like the, the great Imam al-Ghazali, Hujjat al-Islam, who was a, a great master of the outward sciences, meaning the formal, like, ulum al-Zahir. He was a great theologian, he was a great, great jurist, he was a great, um, he was uh, deeply uh, versed in the science of scholastic debate, but he was also a became a master of the science of the inward. And one of the things he talks about, he said, the heart, which is the locus or the focal point of the ihsan, sometimes it can be cracked. It's like a glass, so the, the fluid just falls through. Sometimes it can be upside down, so you can be pouring things on top of it, and it's just not able to contain it. So this science is also about that, once again, that self-diagnosis. Where am I at? Am I in a place to receive? Am I ready to receive? I'll give you a clear, a clear example. You know if someone's like irritable, just in a bad mood? Huh? N nobody knows? Never felt that? Maybe I'm teaching the wrong people. <laughs> I know the Swedish are typically a lot more calmer than the Brits. Is that true? We'll see. Yeah. I've got two and a half months with you guys, so it's going to come out sooner or later. Yeah. Here and there are other okay. They have problems. Okay. <laughs> Stop. You said it's a bad. I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not making any judgment. It'd be wrong to do so. Inshallah, many beautiful qualities as well. Alhamdulillah. We made you nations and, and tribes to know one another, not to hate on one another, to know. Because there are distinct individual groups and you know, peoples, but it's to know about the beauty within them. And then the end of the verse, in akramakum عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Know that the most uh, noble in, of you in the sight of Allah is not even to do with your temperament or the way you look or the way you, it's atqaqum, those of you the most conscious of him. That consciousness is also one of the things we'll be exploring over the next 20 years. How to be conscious and aware of Allah. And that's what it's all about, that taqwa. Because the Prophet وسلم, he said, uh, indeed, I am the most conscious of, of you. I'm the most conscious. I'm constantly aware of Allah. And then another narration, he said, At-taqwa And he pointed with his fingers to his heart. وسلم, taqwa is here. So profound. At-taqwa ha-huna. At-taqwa ha-huna. And he recited it three times. And the scholars, they say, that has two meanings. One of them is that the place of taqwa, of consciousness, of ihsan, is the heart. Because he indicated towards his heart. That's where it takes place. You know. Allah says in the, in the Quran, that they have hearts by which they're unable to comprehend with. You know, typically in a Western tradition, it's the mind that does the comprehending. But in the prophetic teaching, it's actually the heart that really deals with that deep comprehension. And the second meaning that the scholars say is a taqwa hahuna. Taqwa is here, meaning taqwa is literally in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's where you're going to find taqwa. That's where you're going to find meaning. That's where you're going to find beauty. That's where you're going to find profundity. That's where you're going to find purpose. That's where you're going to find meaning. That's the place where we're going to orientate ourselves towards. And this is why they say, particularly with the people of this science, 
they, they, one of the, 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 the honorific titles which they refer to the Prophet uh, as is Qiblat al-Ruh or Qiblat al-Arwah. Literally the Qibla of the soul, of the heart. People like stuff for Allah, so you, they pray to the prophets. Well, if you've been praying to the Kaaba, worshipping the Kaaba, then you've got problems. We don't worship the Kaaba, and you're bowing down to it. This is a legislated, uh, directional injunction from Allah in order to, to, to have that state of, of direction, of orientation. We, no, no Muslim has ever worshipped the Kaaba. So, I hope not. That's we're in trouble. This is basically our creed, though. Some time ago, like, there was some general, and he thought, like, the, the, the Muslims worshipped the moon god of Mecca that resided above the Kaaba. And this is, like, within the last five, ten years. This, this is the ignorance where people are at, subhanAllah. So when they talk about Qibla al ruh the Qibla, or the direction of the ruh, it means, it, what it means is... The Prophet وسلم, he's the standard. Indeed, you are upon a vast character. Khuluq is also one of the most important components to the science of Ihsa, of Tazkiyah, of Tarbiyah, good character. And we'll be exploring this. What does it mean? Because good character isn't just putting on a good smile and being a hater from your heart. You know, it's like the, it's a it's a common example, but you know when people are on like uh, like call centers, and you go through training about how to be nice. And then there are always these awkward moments, <laughs> like when they realize that, that they've failed to put you on mute, and they're actually speaking to the person, like, it's just kind of like, but that's really, that, that in the Islamic tradition is not true akhlaq. Akhlaq is that your good character is that your inward is the same as your outward. You know? That you, when you smile at someone, you smile at them with your entire being. And that's all with the people that have a mastery of this science, their smiles are just so overwhelming. They're transformative. Everything that they do is moving because everything is concentrated. It's, dis, it's, it's distilled. You know, as we live a, we, most of our lives, unfortunately, we're so scattered. We're like so diluted in our wijha, in our orientation. There's a bit here. There's a bit there. There's a bit... And it's really difficult when it comes to the prayers. Like, Allahu Akbar. And then we're all over the place. You know? So that's another thing that we hope to do. And it seems like these seem like simple things. This is the essence. You know, one of the greatest awrad, one of the greatest wirds, daily liturgies that we can do is to focus within the five daily prayers. You know? Early peoples, they would know as a gauge of where a person was at spiritually in how they would... Um, be during the prayer. One of the scholars, they say, if you want to have a, an understanding of where you are at spiritually, look at the state of your heart when the adhan goes. And what's really sad, you go to so many parts of the Muslim world, when the adhan is going, people, it's as if it's not even taking place. In Tarim, where we came from, if pe they, they used to, they used to, when the adhan went, they used to sit down in the street and lower their heads and cry. And this is not just a, it's not fairy tales. This is what they would do every adhan, every day. It was so impacting upon their souls and their hearts, the, the implications of what this call meant and what it was calling to, you know, struck so deep within them. That they were just, you know, overwhelmed. You know, like when the Prophet ﷺ was walking, you know, in the streets, and there's this old lady reciting, you know, in the Quran, Hal ataka hadithul Has the has the news of Yom al Qiyamah reached you? You know, Al Ghashia is one of the names of Yom al Qiyamah, the day of, you know, judgment. When and it is that which is encompassing, it completely overwhelms you, your psyche, your soul, your your sight, your hearing, your every sense. Hal ataka hadith al Has the, the, the news of the ghashia come to you? And this is, the, this is a, an old woman reciting the Prophet وسلم, heard it from within the house. And he went down and he started to weep. He said, Atani, Atani, it's come to me, it's come to me. Like that's somebody who's living. That's a soul that's breathing. That's a heart that's alive. 
where are we at? We hear the Quran. It's just, subhanAllah, nothing. Empty. It's just like background music, like when you go into a shop to buy some, a new shirt. <coughs> Seriously. It's just to add to the ambience. SubhanAllah. You know what I mean? So to look at your heart when the adhan goes. The second thing is to look at your heart when you're in the prayer. What's your state? If you want to know a person's state with Allah, what's the state within the prayer? And you'd have previous peoples because of their deep knowledge of ihsan, that they were so, you know, encaptured, just obsessed, just gone in the prayer. Because the salah, as the Prophet said, is your sila. That's your connection with Allah. So it's like, how is that meeting going to be with the one you love? If you're going to be real in anything, it's the prayer. You know? And it's so hard, like often in, in daily life, like in, in the modern world. I'm not going to even say the West too often, because it's not just the West. The East is just as bad. You know, it's just it's cramming in the times. You know? And this is what this science will hope to do, is hopefully afford us some kind of tools and opportunities you know, to kind of really just look a bit deeper into this. I just wanted to read something very, very briefly, and we can, we can close here. There you are. There are a number of ayat, but this is the main one I wanted to go to. Bismillah. Surah Al Imran. Laqad manna Allahu ala al mu'minina. Iz ba'ata fihim rasoolan min anfusihim. Yetlu alayhim ayatihi. Wa yuzakihim wa yu'allimhum al kitab wa al hikmah. Wa in kanu min qablun lafi dalani mubin. Indeed, Allah has men bestowed a great grace. Upon the believers, is ba'atha fihim rasulan, in the, that he sent forth um, amongst them a prophet, yetlu alayhim ayatihi, he recites upon them or over them from his, his, his signs, but it means these verses, the, the Quran. Wa yuzakihim. And he purifies them. And then, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ kitab, And he teaches them the book, the Qur'an. وَالْحِكْمَةِ And the hikmah, which they, they often say is the sunnah. وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَانِ مُبِينَ And even, in, if, even if they were previously in complete disarray, completely all over the place, scattered, he brings you together. He's the mujamma, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's al Jami' sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one that came to reconcile peoples, families, communities, individuals from being scattered, fragmented people that are all over the place to orientated, wholesome, pure human beings that can recognize beauty, experience beauty, and give off beauty. Now what's interesting about this ayah is the tazkiyah takes place before ta'lim al-kitab, before teaching the book. The purification takes place before the teaching, you know. And this is, this is a, a common um, a theme within sacred knowledge, is that there has to be this, um, the vessel has to be clean in order to taste like that which is going to be put into the vessel. Other, otherwise, it's not the same thing, you know. And we need to be really conscious of this, like in, in understanding of our our deen, because many of us are in a different kind of place. minhum from them. Yatlu Now ultimately, this is all with the, with the, under the auspices of the science of Ihsan. 
And we just want to close here just by going through the, the hadith which roots this reality about which we were talking about. So it's narrated by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And he said, one day we were sat with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bayna yadi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there came a man um, with no traces of travel upon him. It's a famous hadith, what's known typically as Hadith Jibreel. His hair was uh, shadid as sawad. He had very black hair. And if you've traveled in the desert, even if you have black hair, it doesn't say black. It goes all like dusty and sand colored because you can't travel it. Even on a bus, you're going to get dirty. It's just the nature of desert travel. And his thawb, his garment, was shadid and bayal. It was intensely white. Meaning this, we didn't recognize him, but he didn't look like somebody who had been traveling here. So that was strange to us. Like his appearance to an Arab in that time was, was strange. Because in an ancient communities, in ancient societies, you'd know everyone. If you're like, oh yeah, we know him. Or if they were gharib, if they were strange, if they were foreign to that culture, to that society, there would be some kind of induction or introduction, or they'd be clear that the guys just rocked up on a camel, and it wasn't like this. And that was the first thing that they noticed. This man didn't look like he was, he just came from travel. And he came up to the Prophet وسلم, and he placed Rukbatay, his two knees, next to the knees of the Prophet وسلم. And he said, Ya, Ras uh, ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad, inform me about Islam. And then the Prophet وسلم, responded, it's to testify, to, 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 to bear witness to the reality that there is no God except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, to establish the five daily prayers, to uh, the zakat, the Ramadan, fasting of the month of Ramadan, and to fast, uh, to go on Hajj to the house, the Kaaba, the one that's able to find a way, the conditions are met. And then he said, Sadaqta. And this is where it became really strange for them. Because to an Arab, if you're saying like, yeah, you're correct. It's like, who are you to say it's cor correct? Like, I'm telling you, you know what I mean? So they were like, we, we found it strange that he asked Rasulullah and then he said, you're correct. Then the next question, inform me about Iman. Now, once again, we can go into this, but I'm conscious about saying faith. Faith in a Western con context is not Iman. Iman is, is, is not faith. Faith is almost something maybe like, almost like a gambler's belief. I believe it in case there is a hell that, you know, at least I don't end up in a dodgy space on Yom al -Qiyamah. That's not faith. That's actually kufr in Islam. That, that takes you out of the fold of Islam. And Iman is something very different. It's related to aman, al-Iman min al-Aman. It's from safety, this concept of like, you're in a safe space now because you've embraced reality. But it's, it's, it's not to do with just a kind of, you know, some lingering doubts. It's far from that. And the science of Ihsan deals with strengthening that to the level of Yaqeen, which we'll be exploring, inshallah, in the forthcoming weeks. So he says it's to believe in Allah, His messengers, His angels, His revealed books, the last day, and that all good, that which we perceive as good and evil, ultimately is all from Allah. Allah never loses control of anything. And then he says, Sadaqta, He's spoken the truth. And he said, we, like, we just increased now, like, we were perplexed. And then he says, inform me about Ihsan. So here's this word, and this is the crux of what we want to talk to. We've mentioned the ayat from the Quran, and now from that which the Prophet ﷺ gave to us. He said, inform me about Ihsan. Now, in, in, a, in the context, in Arabia at that time, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of shifting of paradigms. Like the, the Arabs would have understood what Ihsan meant linguistically in the language of the Arabs because they said things like Ihsan, Ahsanta or Hadha min al Ihsan. But it was, a, it was a reworking, a reshifting of a paradigm, a rerouting of a, a new definition 
What does Ihsan mean? And the Prophet said, and this is the prophetic definition of this science, meaning that anything that goes outside of this definition has nothing to do with this discipline, nor this art, nor this science. So implicitly this science has to be from the Book of Allah and has to be from the Sunnah of the Master of Allah. If it's not, I mean, if it's just some kind of thing that's like grabbed around from various world mysticisms and spiritualities, this has nothing to do with this reality. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, It's to worship Allah and ta'bud Allah, to devote yourself to Allah, as if you see Him. Like Allah is not directional, Allah has no body, Allah has no just basic aqidah, every Muslim understands this. So how do you worship Allah as if you see Him? Bi'ayn al-basira, with the heart. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ I'm just going to translate it and we're going to unpack it slightly and we're going to close there. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ And if you don't see Him, meaning you're not at that degree of what they would, uh, of that particular spiritual station you might classify it as. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكِ Know that He sees you. Know that He sees you. Know that you're being watched in every moment. Everything that manifests from you, the way you move, the way you, the speech you utter, but even your motives, even the agenda, even the reasoning, far, far deeper down that great thread of agendas and intentionality, which you may not even be conscious of, فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكْ He sees you. وَفِعْلَ الْمَاضِي تَدُلْ عَلَى الْإِسْتِمْرَارِ the, the present tense, it's indicative of that which is continuous, like Yarak, now. Allah is watching us all now. Who Yarana? We were never absent. Every time you weren't conscious of us, don't think that was us being unconscious of you. Allah is always aware, and an awareness which is befitting of Him. Jalla Jalala. فَإِنُّهُ يَرَاك So He sees you. Now, the science of the Ihsan, as we alluded to before, deals ultimately with the highest level of human potentiality. It's now this seed, and people are not only it's giving off the fruit, but people are benefiting from it. And that's what they call mushahada. And they say it's the greatest thing that a human heart can ever experience. So it's the science of being happy at one level. And who doesn't want to be happy? Everyone wants to be happy. But nobody knows the method and nobody knows what that, mean, that means. It's getting away from all examples of false happiness and fixating upon the creator of happiness. Mushahada. And the greatest happiness for the people that, that of this science that are rooted in this is to have that connection with Allah. You could even say that relationship with Allah. That you see Him. Now that doesn't mean with the eye. But when you pray, you enter into reality, which we can delve in, in future weeks uh, in more detail about this experience, which is so overwhelming and what happens to the people of this experience. Now, that's the pinnacle, the Prophet is saying. You want the pin pinnacle of spirituality within our tradition? That's it. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ And if you don't see him, meaning you've not reached that degree of mushahada, then let me give you a method in order to reach that, because the Prophet ﷺ never severed people, oh, yeah, then you just might as well just go back home to bed. No. If you're not there yet, then keep on going. And this is why this science is, as we mentioned, it's empowering. It's the most empowering science, because it gives you hope. It doesn't matter about where you're at or who you are or what you're doing. It, it has to be full, filled with hope. Because it's, do, it's to do with Allah. How could you not be hopeful? And this is the Sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ, the most knowledgeable of, and the most conscious and most aware of any human being of Allah. And his way, وسلم, he would always love optimism, because that's the default. We should have a good opinion of Allah. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ If you don't see him, فَإِنُّهُ يَرَاكْ And this is what they call مُرَاقَبَةً, which is one of the definitions 
which, which we'll be exploring, inshallah, in its own individual session. What does muraqa mean? What does muraqaba mean? What does it mean? And what are the stages? What's the method of knowing that Allah sees you? Okay, Allah sees me. Huh? So what? You know, what does that mean? What does He see of me? What does that? What are the implications to that? What are the degrees to that? Because there's different stages of muraqaba. People think like, well, you know, yeah, I know I can see something about my intentions. Yeah. What about your sir? What about that which is yet to come? What which is the whole? It's a whole science. For innuhu yarak, know that he sees you. And this was the state of our Prophet In essence, the science of ihsan, just as with the science of tajweed, just as with the science, every science is all about him And what we want to come away with is in uh, a deepening and an expansion of our awareness of this, the centrality of the Messenger of Allah to every single one of us, to this tradition. He wasn't just like a messenger that came and like a postman. Like he was the message, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everything he did was conveying a message, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everything he did, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You want to know ihsan? It was him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's no other definition to ihsan other than him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, in essence, what we're doing and what we hope to be doing throughout this period is becoming more like him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How do we become more like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we become rectified and reconciled and conscious like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we become beautiful like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we speak beautifully like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we interact with people like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we behave like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we pray like Sayyidina Muhammad how do we approach Allah through the lens of Sayyidina Muhammad How do we look over other people's faults like Sayyidina Muhammad How do we be selfless like Sayyidina Muhammad The pinnacle of Ihsan, the root of all Ihsan, of all beauty. And he's the one that said Allah taught me these manners, he taught me Ihsan, he taught me what Adab is all about. فَأَحْسَنَ تَأْدِيبِ And Allah, Allah had ihsan. What's Allah's ihsan? Allah had ihsan in the way that he taught me. And this is why, you know, we're going to close by, by saying, Alhamdulillah, um, we're really looking forward to these uh, sessions. It's an opportunity to remind and to restore and to... Uh, regain that which has been depleted because we all need each other. Suhb is one of the most essential uh, components of this science, that different hearts, when they come together, they feed off each other. Every single ruh, every single soul has come with its own rizq, its own sustenance that it, it was seeking. You know. And through these exchanges and through these, you know, which are not, all, most, most of these exchanges are not verbal because they carry through something called Senad and this is something which you can explore also because we have the Qur'an the science is rooted in the Qur'an the literal uncreated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's rooted in the, the sayings and the actions the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa however in, in accordance to whose understanding this is where we come full circle there are many claimants to this is from the Quran, this is from, but in accordance to whose understanding? Our tradition is one of authorization, of that apprenticeship being taken place. So somebody is able to carry something of this light and this tradition and pass it on to other people. It's a tradition of conduits. And if you're not connected back to that source of light, it's like reading a book. And one of the examples that was given to me recently, I thought it was very beautiful is that imagine you have two children and one of them you say you know you're just going to go and live somewhere else but we're going to give you a book about our principles about how you think we think you should be raised and it's going to have everything the do's the don'ts 
just run along with that. And then you have another child which stays with you at the home and you nurture them. And there are contexts and there are nuances and there are instances where you show them, no, in this context, I know this is what the book says, but there's a different way of doing it. There's a way of doing it. There's a beauty. There's a subtlety, you know. Do you think the two children are going to turn out the same? That's Senate. So somebody can read from a book and it's got all the rules. You know, it's the same book. But if you don't have Senate, if you don't have those people that have been trained, you know, for years to, to, to unpack those things and know how to deliver at the right time, then it's going to be just a bunch of rules. It's going to be too heavy. So our reliance is not on what's being said, especially in gatherings like this. Our reliance is this is a, a medalist, a gathering, which is primarily not just informational, but it's transformational. And that comes from every single one of us, that we go back home and we make an intention. We make an intention now. Why are we here? What are we doing? You know, it's to become a person of meaning to become that pe person of the ihsan, you, that you become a sign now back to Allah. You know, when the Sahaba asked who are the, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who are the people of Allah, who are the people of ihsan? He said, hum idha ru'u dhukir Allah. It's those people that when you gaze upon them, Allah is remembered. You can't help but remember Allah in their presence. These are the signs, that, the signposts that bring people back to Allah because their hearts are illuminated with this beauty beauty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these sessions um, be a source of rooting and reality for every single one of us as individuals and as components of families and of communities and of societies and of a broader ummah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in these sessions that we become people who are inspired and inspiring. You know. You know, motivated and a source of motivation, connected truly to that which is real. We ask Allah that Allah shows us that which is real as it truly is, that which is authentic as it truly is, and allows us to follow in its way, and allows us to show falsehood, batil, that which is not real, inauthentic, not the real deal, you know, as it truly is, and allows us to abstain from it, to move away from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take every single one of us by the hand, into the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu that we feel a closeness to him that we've never felt before. And we have an intimacy with him that we never knew that was even possible. And through that closeness that there's a, a reality which is unlocked in every single one of us, causing us to blossom and bloom into our fullest spiritual potential to be conduits and bastions of this great tradition in this cold, wet land. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we become sources of, of warm hearts that warm people, you know, sources of light. This is why this is what Muslim, this is what you're all about. And this is this is why you're here. This is the purpose. This is the whole point. To be with Allah. You know. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's our only use. Like as fathers, we can't be good fathers except we're with Allah. Our children don't need us, they need us with Allah. Mothers saying. Can only, you're only of any use to your children and you're, close, you're closest to Allah. They don't need you, they need you with Allah. As friends, as society. And that's what it's all about. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unlock for us the beauty of this science, allow us to taste it, allow us to be a source of transformation that's deeply rooted and never, never uh, moves away from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join our hearts together and allow those who, people who are accepted in this gathering for all of us to enter into their acceptance, to connect us to the people of Senate, to the people that have been authorized in this great tradition, to enter our dhikr and our remembrance into their dhikr, our intentions into their intentions, our inward states into their states and dissolve into that reality, thus flooding us with the lights of this great tradition that are transformative that we feel it and it resonates deep to, down to our very being, the core of our being. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.